Hello. Today we are going to discuss a topic germane to most businesses. Is your business a target for cyber attacks? We are fortunate to have a local expert, Bob Weiss, here to help sort out your exposures and preventive steps. He will now take over and introduce himself. Bob, it's all yours. Hi, I'm Bob Weiss. I'm a senior cybersecurity engineer at a company called uh, Computer Integration Technologies uh, based in Woodbury, Minnesota. I am a uh, certified ethical hacker and also a certified information systems security professional. I've been a longtime cybersecurity blogger, and you can find me at www.wiseguyscybersecurity.com. It's all one line, one long word, and it's W-Y-Z-G-U-I-S cybersecurity.com. So let's talk about um, our agenda for today. First, we're going to cover typical exploits to give you a taste for what uh, the cyber criminals are up to and why. Uh, we're going to look at the cost of cyber crime, uh, give some examples, uh, take a look at the legal issues. We're going to take a look at some of the important compliance issues that many businesses face, including uh, PCI DSS for the payment card industry. Uh, HIPAA for the medical industry and GLBA for all of the other, uh, you know, corporations that are out there, um, especially publicly traded corporations. And then we're going to take a look at cybersecurity preparedness, uh, talk a little about creating an incident response plan. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of uh, cybersecurity awareness training for your employees, uh, cover a bit on passwords. Um, Another section on email, a uh, section dealing specifically with banking exploits, and then the importance of encryption. So you should be planning for an attack. You will be hacked. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the when may have occurred in the past. Um, you may be hacked already and not know it. And the great misfortune is that sometimes you'll be informed by customers, by your credit card processor or bank or by a government regulator that this intrusion has happened to your network. You may be fined or sued and it may be in the news. So where are you vulnerable? Uh, cybersecurity is important on all your devices including desktop and laptop computers and tablets and smartphones. And yes, smartphones are computers. In fact, my smartphone is probably, I don't know, 100 times more powerful than the very first computer I had in, in the, back in 1995. So these are all computing devices. They all have vulnerabilities that are exploitable by uh, skilled cyber attackers. Um, are there special defenses for mobile devices? Uh, it is possible in either your, you know, the, the Apple Store or in the uh, Android Store to download a companion uh, protection product for um, your phone, you know, from the same security company that you're getting your uh, computer security software product from. So if you're a semantic customer, Symantec's got a smartphone app. If you're um, Kaspersky, they've got a smartphone app. So I would in, uh, recommend uh, doing that. There are other uh, types of defenses that you can deploy on your phone. I would recommend using a um, pass, you know, passcode uh, to lock your phone. I know it's a little extra hassle, but um, if, you know, if your phone's unlocked, anybody can use it and uh, extracting the information that's on your phone, including pictures and documents, is relatively really trivial. So typical exploits that you're likely to run across in your day-to-day -day life on the internet. You may get a phishing email, and that phishing email is going to be designed to redirect you either by a link uh, to a website uh, where you will be Ask for some information. It could very well be for user ID and password for your email account or some online account that you have. 
or you may end up at a um, getting an attachment that uh, when you open the attachment it downloads a remote access Trojan horse product and then your computer can be accessed remotely by the attackers and other exploits can be installed and it can be used for a variety of purposes some of which we'll talk about in a little bit um, I could hijack a computer and join it to a botnet. A botnet is a big collection of hijacked computers that can be rented by the bot herder. That's what we call the people who are running the botnets. Um, can be rented for a variety of purposes, including uh, brute force password cracking, uh, could be used for a distributed denial of service attack on another uh, computer, or could be used for sending spam or phishing email exploits. Uh, you will run across spamming. Um, we all get tons of spam. And much of the spam is used to sell illegal or fraudulent products, although some of the spam that we get is, in fact, representing perfectly legitimate products. But the spammer gets a fee for every click through they get from somebody who clicks through on one of their emails. Uh, they could be stealing intellectual property. Once I've gained access to a computer remotely, I can use that computer as a launching point to um, stealing intellectual property is another exploit. Once I've achieved remote access to a computer, I can use that computer as a launching point to explore the network that it's attached to and to find valuable files and information and intellectual property and download that um, to my computer or I can send you special exploits that are crafted to help me help myself to your online banking and financial accounts. Other exploits include distribution of malware. It may be directly from an email attachment. It may be that the link takes you to a website where there is malware embedded in the page that installed installs when you get there. I could be posting confidential information on the internet. I could be using the threat of that disclosure as part of an extortion scheme. I could be holding critical information for ransom, much as what happens if you were to get a uh, crypto locker or other uh, crypto ransomware infection where all of your personal files and important information is encrypted and then you have to pay the, uh, the cyber criminals a fee to get the decryption key so that you can get your information back. Or I could be attacking critical network infrastructure to disrupt operations. That might include something as big as uh, an electrical power company. It might include um, a di distributed denial of service attack where I have thousands of machines in a botnet that are trying to access the same website over and over again with the uh, goal of disrupting operations or possibly crashing the web server. Now, it could be theft of data. Data has value. In fact, all data has value. Typically, they're looking for things like user credentials, which are the usernames and passwords that we use to get into different accounts and services. It might be employee information, including W-2 information. Uh, social security information and that sort of thing for employee theft or tax refund fraud. Uh, it could be customer data for a variety of regions. Um, could be patient information. Patient records are particularly valuable because medical records contain much more detailed information about a target about an individual than almost any other information that uh, that you can come across in a database. Might be looking for financial data. Uh, might be looking for proprietary information. Other cybersecurity issues, um, you know, in most cases what we're running across is um, organized criminal groups who are actively pursuing uh, cybercrime as a major, you know, revenue-making operation. But there are other groups like Anonymous and LulzSec and others that are politically motivated and engaging in something that's called hacktivism. Hacktivism is a term that combines hacking with the term activism, and it may be more of a um, political, societal, or socially motivated. It's certainly not a money-making enterprise. It's more to make a statement. And then there's cyber warfare, 
we've seen more and more information about nation states that are engaging in cyber war. In fact, the U.S. and Israel uh, attacked the uh, nuclear energy resources in Iran using Stuxnet and then later on another exploit called Flame. Uh, about a year ago, there was an unexplained failure of the Ukrainian electrical grid, which was a result of some type of a cyber attack, either from Russia or, you know, parties unnamed. It, it was assumed to be a Russian, you know, part of the Russian incursion into the Ukraine. And then we have government-sponsored cyber spying by agencies like the National Security Agency and countries and nation states like China and frankly, Great Britain and um, even the Canadians have a, uh, a, a cyber spying organization. So those are where the major threats lie for us um, these days. So the top two attack vectors are email. And email is by far and away the largest, representing about 90 to 95% of all um, computer breaches start as an email with a clickable link or attachment. Um, the two varieties that we talk about are phishing, which tends to be a sort of a mass mailing exploit where the same message will be sent out to thousands or even millions of potential victims. And then there's spear phishing, which is a much more sophisticated and time consuming attack. But this is where we're specifically going after an individual. And the cyber criminals will spend a great deal of time researching and getting to know this individual. They may hijack their email account in order to read the emails that are being sent and received off that account, in order to have access to their calendar, in order to have access to their contact list. So phishing and spear phishing are the two main email exploits that we're looking at. And then the other uh, place where you can run into trouble is on websites. You may get on a website, a perfectly legitimate website that you've been on many, many times and end up with a malware infection if that website has been compromised in some way by cyber attackers. Or you may be redirected to spoofed or cloned sites that are designed to look exactly like your target site. In some cases, attackers will uh, register a domain name that is a close misspelling of a popular website like Goggle instead of Google.com. And then if you had just happened to fat finger it, you end up on you know a compromised site just accidentally. Um, you also may be directed to a website where malware distribution is happening if your search engine has been changed without your specific action or knowledge. Uh, search redirection uh, exploits will send you to, uh, give you search results that send you to sites that either the attacker is getting paid to send you there, or they'll send you to websites of their own creation in order to um, infect you with malware or collect information from you, you know, with, with a form of some type. Cost of cybercrime. Average annual loss per employee is $15,000. In 2015, $40 billion in losses worldwide. 96% uh, of small businesses are unprepared for a cyber attack, according to a 19 or to a 2013 Ernst and Young survey. And if you're a small business owner, even a micro business, and you're thinking, I'm just too small to be of interest to these guys, they're going to be going after bigger targets. This is not a true statement. Small businesses are being specifically targeted by cyber criminals because, frankly, they have more money in the bank than, say, an individual victim, um, like an individual man or woman, and they have much less security and much less sophisticated security than larger enterprise businesses. And in many cases, the employees have little or no cybersecurity training and so are unaware of the risks that they face when they're going through their inbox in the morning or doing other activities online. This makes small businesses easy to exploit and the payouts are good enough to be attractive to cyber criminals. So for example, we have a 15 person fuel distribution company in South Carolina with a monthly payroll of $60,000. 
thieves gained access to their bank account using a compromised password. The bank unfortunately had recently made changes to its security process to make online banking easier, which made it easier for the thieves. Um, the uh, thieves got away with um, $1.3 million and insurance only covered a portion of the loss. Next, here we have an escrow company that loses $1.5 million. This is a nine person company, um, escrow company in California. There were three electronic transfers of about $500,000 each, one in December of 2012 and two in January of 2013. The bank typically provided two-factor authentication for its customers who were using online banking, but it wasn't working at the time. And although the company had never transferred funds overseas, and in fact, as an escrow company, probably never transferred funds out of California, the bank did not question the large transfers. Even after the first one was reported, they still allowed the second and third ones to continue. The company's in receivership and because some of the escrowed funds were, um, were, were you know, federal uh, housing, you know, HUD money and what have you, uh, there's a federal investigation going on. Construction company loses $500,000. Well, it was $447,000, but you know, who's counting? Stolen from a construction company. A banking Trojan was downloaded from a website and it, when the employee logged into the bank's online portal uh, and after authentication was confirmed, uh, the employee begins making legitimate payments. In this case, the software went out and contacted the attacking company who was able to remotely access and join the session in progress and they made 27 fund transfers totaling $447,000 to many numerous bank accounts that were spread out over the globe and by the time um, this was figured out the money had disappeared without a trace. Vendor opens door for target attack. We all are familiar with the target attack and um, but what may not be as well known is that target was not really to blame for this attack. Uh, in fact, it was a small uh, heating ventilation and air conditioning contractor in the state of Ohio that took care of a few stores in the Ohio and Western Pennsylvania region for Target. Uh, undoubtedly, there was a phishing email that was directed to members of this company, uh, and that email would have installed password stealing malware. <clears throat> Target network credentials were stolen, and that access was how the cyber criminals uh, got into the target network and eventually migrated over to the point of sale system network and uh, collected credit card transaction information on 40 million customers. There was another uh, group of 50 million customers who had information about them stolen out of a database. It wasn't credit card information, but it was other types of customer information. And there can be legal issues for having a breach. It's not bad enough that, you know, they come and mess up your business and take your money, but there can be regulatory fines. There can be civil suits. Um, cyber insurance, even if you have it, may not cover willful negligence. Um, there will be an issue if you don't have cybersecurity or computer use policy in place. Uh, and it would be helpful also in the the case of civil suits and regulatory fines have an incident response plan in place as well and we'll be talking about some of that a little bit later. Next. So let's take a look at some of the common compliance issues that a lot of companies face and the first one is PCI DSS and PCI is payment card uh, industry. They're at uh, payment card industry data security standard 3.1 uh, and the main Parts of this process are, or of this standard are to build and maintain a secure network, protect cardholder data, um, to have a vulnerability management program in place, strong access control measures, and what that basically means is the physical and electronic controls like user IDs and passwords and, and you know, maybe controlled door controls and what have you. 
Uh, you need to regularly monitor and test your networks for compliance and maintain an information security policy uh, book. So penalties for PCI um, non-compliance can be between $5,000 to $100,000 per month or $50 to $90 per cardholder record that is lost. Um, in addition to that, there's brand reputation damage and there can be civil litigation in many cases where credit card information was disclosed. Um, there have been class action suits back against the company. Uh, the PCI DSS compliance used to be a fairly trivial undertaking in the last two years. Uh, the payment card industry has, you know, paid for a lot of fraud um, because when your credit cards use fraudulently, we're not on the hook for it. It's the payment card companies and, and the retailers who are. And um, <clears throat> in order to make this, in order to make this uh, less expensive for them, they put some real teeth in the compliance. Next, then there's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which started out many years ago, basically as a um, law that for the first time guaranteed patients the rights to access and to transfer their patient medical records to other providers. But it became a um, in, concerned with keeping patient data uh, safe and secure and it regulates things like who can read patient information, how data is transferred, and data that's in transmission, whether that transmission is across the network or whether it's going out the door on a laptop or in a flash drive, needs to be encrypted. So data in motion, even if it's physical motion, needs to be encrypted. And then it also regulates how and where data can be stored. Uh, interestingly enough, the transmission encryption um, requirement is not uh, not equaled here. Encryption is a recommendation at this point in time, but not a requirement for uh, patient records that are stored in like a big database server somewhere. I think the assumption is, is that these servers are already secure and we don't need to encrypt the data, but every day we hear news stories about how this is not true. And encryption will probably become a requirement in the near future. A, HIPAA business associate, any company that is a vendor to a HIPAA uh, contractor who may directly or inadvertently have contact with patient information needs to be HIPAA certified as well as a business associate. The company I work for um, are trained and certified to be um, HIPAA compliant and, and know what to do if they inadvertently uh, get in, you know, inadvertently see patient data. So HIPAA violation penalties uh, start out with accidental um, breaches of $100 per violation. That would be $100 per record uh, with an annual max of $25,000. For cause, $1,000 per violation with an annual max of $100,000. Willful neglect, which means that we knew we had a problem and we didn't do anything about it anyway, is much more expensive at $10,000 per violation. And uncorrected willful neglect is when you know you have a problem, you don't fix it, the compliance agencies come and say you've got a problem and you need to fix it, and then you don't. And that gets very, very expensive at $50,000 per violation with an annual maximum of $1.5 million. Next. And then we have the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, GLBA. Um, there's a financial privacy rule here that consumers must be informed about how information is used and may opt out of information sharing. Uh, this is when your bank might use your financial, you know, your personal information with a marketing partner. Uh, you can opt in, in and out of that. Consumer information uh, needs to be covered by a written security plan and implementation. And there have to be, there are also pretexting provisions. Pretexting is a social engineering exploit in which you know maybe a person calls in to the call center, pretending to be another in order to get information. Um, that staff needs to be trained 
to uh, be aware of social engineering and how to defeat it. And now we move on to GLBA penalties. Penalties for violating GLBA are um, considerable for financial institutions. They can be fined up to $100,000 for each violation. Officers and directors can be directly fined for up to $10,000 each. And there are criminal penalties of imprisonment up to five years, a fine or both. And GLBA violation is, is a violation of federal law. Um, or GLBA violations in connect in uh, that happen in addition to another criminal activity can um, in double fines and imprison and cause imprisonment of up to ten years. So let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity preparedness. Um, what kind of things can your business as a small business do? to secure itself um, from cyber attack. And the first number one item is, is to patch. And what we're talking about here are things like Windows updates and Java updates and Adobe updates and other software updates. If you keep your operating system up to date and fully patched and the software that's installed on your system up to date and fully patched, you dramatically reduce the um, attack surface for cyber attackers. So this is one thing that's uh, quite important and that many companies engage in either haphazardly or in some cases they're, they're avoiding, you know, Windows updates because it causes problem with some line of business application that they had made for them. And rather than fixing the line of business application, they think it's easier to, you know, avoid Windows updates. Well, that's just a, a bad trade-off. Most of the patches that we get are security related. A few of them um, are feature and functionality, but, but the vast majority of the patching that, that goes out is uh, to patch security vulnerabilities that are discovered uh, in the course of using the, the, so the software and operating systems. Second thing to do is to back up your data. Um, this is a good idea even from a non-security standpoint because hard drives fail and servers crash and information that is written to those devices can be uh, irretrievable. And in some cases, companies that have lost their data go out of business uh, quite quickly in, in less than three years. So having good backups and testing those backups to make sure that they actually work should you need them is an important cybersecurity uh, preparedness action. You also want to keep your anti-malware software up up to date. So if you're running Kaspersky or Bit, uh, Bitdefender or any of the other, uh, you know, Norton, whatever, um, you'll want to make sure that the uh, so that the anti-malware updates are happening automatically, like they're supposed to be. You'll want to enforce a password policy. In a lot of very small businesses that I've worked with over the years, um, there are no passwords. You turn the computer on and it's on. You sit down and you work on it. And the different user can come in and sit down at that computer and use it just like it was their own. Um, the importance of having a password is that if your employees need a password, then the bad guys need a password too. And it's just one more th thing that they need to discover in order to take advantage of your system. Uh, in addition to using a long and strong and complex password, you would want to add two-factor authentication wherever that's available. This is an extra step in the authentication process where after you enter your user ID and password, another box comes up and you use some sort of a one-time password or passcode. And many times uh, this type of a system works with a smartphone application, something like um, uh, like the one from Google or uh, yeah, Google Authenticator or the other uh, popular one is called Authy. Uh, it might also be that you just simply have a one-time passcode text message to your phone. Uh, those are the two most pop prevalent methods. And you'll want to create alertness through training and events. Nothing 
works better or the most bang for the buck that you can get in cyber um, preparedness is training your staff. Uh, most threats, as we have already talked about, come in through the email and your staff needs to be aware of what those look like, how to detect them, what to do with them if they think they got one, and um, what to do if they unfortunately open the door and think that they have an infection. You need to have you know some employee training around that. So computer incident response planning is another activity that companies who are serious about security are going to engage in. They're going to plan to be attacked. They're going to have a written plan knowing who is in charge, who gets notified, who members of the response team are. They may have a cybersecurity expert on retainer if they don't have one on staff. They'll be reviewing insurance coverage, specifically cyber insurance coverage, but they may be looking at you know, other insurance coverage if, if part of a cyber attack actually involves physical intrusion into the, into the, the, the building. Um, that would be covered by regular insurance. Um, you want to review le any legal requirements that your business um, has under law or regulation and any exposure or risk you have to lawsuits and you want to have a plan for a media response. The media doesn't jump on all of these things but um, it can happen and you'll want to have something to say planned in case you know CARE 11 or Eyewitness News is outside your building with one of their cool satellite trucks and looking for it. So the after part of the incident response plan, if you have an intrusion and you're executing your plan, you want to find out what happened. This can be reviewing your um, security logs on the computers that were affected. You'll want to remove affected devices from the network and save them for forensic or evidentiary needs. You do not want to wipe the drive. In fact, best practices are to remove them from the network without turning them off. So you'd basically remove the, the ethernet cable or whatever other network connection, wireless or whatever, and leave the computer running um, so your cybersecurity expert can determine what's happened and where this is all heading. Uh, you may need to report this to the police and the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center. And if the media becomes involved, you will want to respond to the media. You will want to be brief but truthful. Something like, yes, we've been breached. We're not entirely sure of the full extent of the damage, but we'll keep you apprised as more information becomes available and we will be contacting our customers in order to advise them of the breach. Something. Training your staff. We already talked about how um, cybersecurity awareness training can be the best bang for your buck. Um, you'll want to train your employees using something like this webinar. Uh, or you may want to hire a trainer. Um, I certainly have done my share of in-person trainings um, with employers and uh, these go quite well. And you want to create a data practices policy if you don't have one already and if you do you'll want to review it and make sure it's up to date. And just be aware that sophisticated security defenses cannot prevent a malware breach permitted when an employee clicks on a malicious link in an email. Once the threat is inside the company, as it will be with an email, um, all the fancy perimeter defenses are not going to help you much. Just something to bear in mind. So the basics for uh, you know small business cybersecurity, you need internet security software on every computer and server. You'll want some sort of a hardware firewall, like maybe a sonic wall or a watch guard. And um, the new uh, next generation firewalls not only block attacks from the outside, but they uh, do deep packet inspection. So they're looking for malicious content in the traffic that's coming in through the, the permitted pathways um, and they some of them are also looking for 
traffic that is leaving the building going to unusual destinations in Asia or Eastern Europe or Russia or Brazil. Um, an intrusion detection system. This will detect attack traffic both outside and inside the network. Or you may want to take a look at getting what's called a SIM or a security information and event management system. This provides real-time analysis of security alerts by network hardware and applications and alerts your IT staff or your IT provider to um, events that are, you know, when they are beginning in your company. So let's move on to password policy. We all know what the rules are, but I'm going to give you some new ones. Ten characters or longer, and the or longer is really like the best advice. Um, Ten characters would be a minimum for a relatively trivial, um, I would say 12 to 15 characters is a better idea. Um, the reason for this is that most passwords are cracked by high powered machines. And I saw a demonstration at a security seminar I went to where I, in the space of an hour, <coughs> the uh, presenter built a password cracking uh, botnet using servers that he purchased on the fly from Amazon Web Services. And then he sent a couple thousand passwords, encrypted passwords up to be cracked and had solutions for the majority of them by the time the hour was up. So it's, it's frighteningly easy to uh, solve for even encrypted passwords. An eight character password will crack in under eight hours, but if you get to 10 or 12 or 15, um, even with high, the best equipment, it can take decades or hundreds of years or even millennia to um, calculate the solution for passwords of that length. You don't want to use any words in any language because there are password cracking routines that already have solved for all the available words. And you want to use complexity rules, at least one of each uppercase, lowercase numbers or symbols um, for your password. But the important part is to make a long password as long as you're comfortable with. And you can do things like character substitution, although in this example for the word password uh, has been solved. And in fact, every possible variation that you might think about for the word password has been solved for, so don't do this one. You might want to use a passphrase such as at M capital B W U one zero C P W exclamation point. This would be a password for at my business. We use 10 character passwords. Two factor authentication is a, a very good way to protect um, against the loss of your password, even with the loss of your password without the one-time password that is coming on your phone, uh, an attacker will not be able to get access to that account. Um, I use two-factor authentication anywhere that it is offered, and I recommend it highly um, to my clients and to people that I give this presentation to. You can check your password strength at passfault.com. Passfault.com is run by a nonprofit organization, a security organization called OWASP, and their focus is on uh, web application security. And uh, so you don't have to worry about, they're not storing the passwords you're testing there, they're just testing them out and telling you how long it would take to crack using typical hardware. Um, and nothing is going to matter if you lose plain text passwords to a key logger or a phishing exploit, which is to say that if you give it up willingly by filling it in on a form, on a fake web page, or um, some other way, um, it doesn't matter how clever or long it is because they'll just have the password and they won't even have to solve for a solution. Now have a uh, look at pass fault. This is what it looks like when you get there. You just simply enter your password and click on the analyze button and this password is incredibly weak, take less than a less than a day to crack. Email security. You never want to click on a link in an email. It's always safer to type in the address manually or to use a shortcut that you save to your browser, you know, shortcut bar. So if you get a 
email from your bank that says, holy cow, we've got a problem with your account, and please click on this link and uh, enter your user ID and password so we can straighten this out. Rather than clicking on the offered link, you would just simply type in www.nameofmybank.com or use the shortcut or, um, or link that you have saved on your desktop or on your browser toolbar. Never open an attachment before confirming who sent it and why. And using email encryption when you can has become a good idea. Um, many, very many people are hoovering up this information, governments and what have you, and if you want to keep your personal business private, uh, encryption is one way to do that. Next, physical security. In many small businesses, I've seen the server, you know, kind of in an odd corner or on an unused desk or um, under the knee hole in the um, receptionist desk or in any number of unsecured locations. At the very least, this should be locked in a closet. Uh, it's better if you have an actual server room where maybe your internet equipment and, and the network switch and all the uh, communication gear is kept under lock and key. You want to be aware of unescorted visitors or vendors. With mobile employees and laptop users should put the laptop in trunk, not on the seat of the car. Uh, and when you pull into a parking lot, moving your laptop or your purse or other valuable items from the car to the trunk puts you at risk for theft by people who just simply wait in parking lots observing this behavior. And once you're in the store, they come with a crowbar and poof, and they've got your stuff. Uh, intellectual property often leaves the building on a flash drive. So you may want to consider putting in measures in place that limit um, the ability to use flash drives on a computer. And use data encryption to protect against loss or theft of computers. So if you have a bunch of information on your laptop and the laptop regularly leaves the building, it's a good idea to turn on um, BitLocker or some other type of encryption to encrypt that data so that if the computer is lost, the data is not usable to whoever took it. Next, avoid phishing emails. These are fake emails that look like they came from the real organization. They may have an attachment, often in zip format, um, the zip format ones will often install exploit, exploit codes such as CryptoWall ransomware. Um, malicious links, if you click on them, will take you to fake websites where you may be asked to give up information or where you may get uh, Trojan horse, you know, remote access malware downloaded and installed on your computers so that the criminals can come back later and browse around your computer at, at their leisure. Uh, you also may be surrendering personal information via a web form based on results from, you know, clicking on a link in a phishing email. Next. A slide that kind of shows you ways to, to, to de determine whether or not you've got a fish on the hook or not. And in this case, I have an email that came to me uh, purportedly from Green, Green Winnick Lawyers and it says, notice to appear, view a copy of the court notice here. Please read it thoroughly. Notice you do not attend the hearing. The judge may hear the case in your absence. Well, this sounds fairly threatening. And you know your immediate impulse is to click on the word here and find out more. But let's take a look at this email first. First of all, Green Winnick Lawyers is the, on the from line. But the name behind this is Lee Chow at ntuh.gov.tw. The TW tells me that this is a Taiwanese email account. It's from the country of Taiwan. Li Chao evidently works for some type of government agency, and his email address is either being spoofed or his email account has been hijacked and is being used to send out this email. By hovering over the link rather than clicking on it, I was able to get a tooltip box to pop up that showed me the destination of the link. And instead of going to something like www.greenwinnick.com, it's going to lilianarestrepo.info.tips.php, and then a long jumble of um, 
code behind this. This is going to someone else's web server, probably somebody who's had their web server hijacked and is hosting a uh, secret page that looks just like the Green Winnick homepage. And of course, then we have the message. The message, there's always a story with phishing emails and almost always the story is designed to change your emotional state from whatever it was a minute ago, which is usually calm and, you know, kind of like normal, to something more elevated like fear, concern, agitation, anxiety, um, possibly greed, possibly anger. It's designed to get you busy clicking before you think and opening attachments or clicking on links and getting yourself into trouble. So um, just be aware this is pretty much true to form here. Let's talk a little bit about web security and specifically, you know, going to websites. You want to use the most up-to-date version of whatever browser is your favorite. The new Microsoft Edge that came with Windows 10, of course, is, is brand new. Uh, Internet Explorer is still available up to uh, Internet Explorer 11, which if you're using Internet Explorer should be the one you're using. Um, Firefox uh, version 26 or newer, uh, the latest version of Chrome, which at the time of this presentation was 31, but it may be higher now. And then if you're using Safari, you'll want to use the latest version of Safari. <coughs> also, you'll want to be wary of changes to your home page or search provider. So if you open your browser and your home page is typically the Google search page and now it says something like um, my web search powered by Google. This means that somebody has hacked your browser, probably one of the websites you went to recently or the day before and changed your search provider to, to one of these um, fake search providers. The problem with these search providers is that the results that they provide typically are not the ones you're looking for and usually um, are companies that have either paid this company for the re referral or may quite frankly be malicious. Now, if you're using a bank and you're using their online banking um, services, you will want to find out what you can about the bank's security features. Um, if you're going to do online banking, you'll want to use all the security tools that they provide, including two-factor authentication and maybe a service like Treasury Management where all payments are held for a second verification. So if you do a transaction, then the next day you have to go in and confirm the transaction before it will be released. You should find out what the bank does if there are unusual transactions. Your bank should be alerting you of unusual transactions and not after they've completed through, but before they're actually going out the door. And find out who's responsible for unauthorized transactions in the event of you know a big fund transfer of the, of the type that we talked about earlier. Um, is the bank gonna back you up or are they just simply going to give you best effort in terms of recovery and you're on the hook for your loss. These are important questions to ask your bank, especially when you're shopping for banks. Um, you'll want to be looking for a banking company that has modern sense and, and it's gone. Protecting against banking Trojans. Um, most of the banking Trojans are written for Windows systems, so doing your banking on a non-Windows PC is not a bad plan. Um, for all you Apple fans out there, yeah, Apple might be better, but there are uh, exploits for the Apple computer as well. Um, two options that we really like, uh, one is using a bootable live CD. This is a, a CD that you, or a DVD that you can uh, start the computer from the CD drive. It'll load typically a version of Linux and you can open a browser, go on to your online banking, do all of your banking and log off. The advantage of using a DVD over a computer is that a DVD cannot be rewritten. 
So all the information that's burned on there is on there. No banking Trojan horses can be added to the CD and makes it um, pretty much 100% uncrackable. Um, or you can use a dedicated computer system for banking and fi financial transactions. A Linux computer would be better than Windows or a Google Chromebook. And the reason we like Chromebooks, and, and not just me, but other security professionals that I've, um, you know, I've read about, the Chromebook is a um, Google product. It's running an operating system called Chromium, which is a version of Linux. And it does not allow for the installation of software programs. It, all it does is, is turn on and open a web browser. You have to do all your working on the web. So if you were like typing a document, you'd go to Google Docs and, um, or Google Apps and, and type it up there using a web browser, type it in the cloud. Because it's a, a browser only, you know, no installation type of a computer, uh, it would be impossible to get a banking Trojan on a Chromebook. Uh, Chromebooks are only 200 bucks and used they're even less and I think that people who are doing online banking just ought to get one of these. Encryption. Encryption is basically taking the information as you're typing it and um, using some fancy math, what I'm going to call fancy math, uh, scrambling it up into a format that's not only unreadable but very difficult to unscramble without knowing the encryption key that was used to scramble it in the first place. So you want to use um, HTTPS websites whenever you can. There's a significant movement afoot in the last year and a half to encourage all companies to, running a website to use HTTPS instead of HTTP the unencrypted um, version, whether or not they're collecting data or engaged in financial transactions or not. This is just, you know, security beats, not security. Um, <clears throat> you wouldn't sell a house that didn't have a lock on the door. And we don't recommend going to websites that don't have a lock on their door, basically. Uh, a virtual private network for mobile workers or traveling employees versus using remote desktop protocol. Um, there are weaknesses in Windows remote desktop protocol that make it easy to exploit. A virtual private network creates basically an encrypted tunnel for um, remote connections to a business network. You'll want to use full disk encryption for laptops. We talked about this earlier in the HIPAA compliance area, but um, laptops get legs and disappear. And in some industries, full disk encryption is required, but it's a very easy thing to set up. And uh, it's a great way to secure the contents of that laptop from casual eavesdropping. Uh, you'll also want to be thinking about encrypting employee and client records and proprietary data that you have stored on computers or servers in your organization. And encrypted email solutions like Zix or Hushmail are also good ideas if, um, if keeping your communications, your email communications private is important for your business. Next. Now a little plug for Computer Integration Technologies and the Cybersecurities Department, which I head up. Um, services that we provide include cybersecurity awareness training. So if you're looking for a really good trainer who can keep it uh, interesting while scaring the uh, bejesus out of your employees about the dangers of uh, the computer world, uh, I'm your guy. Uh, we also perform a variety of security audits, including uh, PCI and HIPAA. Uh, we do vulnerability assessments, both internal and network and external network assessments using tools like Nessus and other tools that, uh, that we have in our arsenal. And we can do penetration testing, which is not only finding vulnerabilities, but actually attempting to exploit them as an attacker would. This provides a sort of real-world um, pretest to see if 
if in fact there are ways to get around the security of your of your network and systems. Uh, computer forensics, which means that we can get in and take a look at the computer and see what happened by looking at the logs and some of the other activity and uh, creating incident response plans and providing incident response resources from our company in the event that you have a breach. The things that um, we offer, we offer a managed security services product called Alien Vault. It's a unified security management product that um, combines uh, the features of a SIM and a log management, uh, as well as providing, you know, the real, you know, real-time detection of anomalous events on your network. Uh, we provide, uh, we are agents for Zix secure email. Um, we have a variety of data backup and recovery solutions. We also can develop computer use and cybersecurity policies and get into business continuity and disaster recovery and computer incident response planning for some of our clients. That wraps it up. Um, my thanks uh, for, in, for sitting through this presentation. If you are interested in talking further about anything you heard about today, you can contact me um, for a free security review or just simply contact me by email bob.weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -S, at cit-net.com or you can call me directly at 651-387-1668 and uh, be happy to answer any questions or have a short discussion with you on any of the things we talked about today. For covering a very scary topic for most of us, who haven't thought about security or have been hacked or what have you. Uh, besides using this webinar, we encourage you to go to your local SCORE chapter and talk to them if you have questions. Now, we have chapters across uh, Minnesota and we also have national chapters, so go to their websites that are on the screen. We also provide a um, uh, dedicated email account. If you have questions that uh, weren't answered, we can pass them on to Bob or maybe answer them ourselves. Now we have to make a, some disclaimers. The content of this webinar is strictly for your training of you, the client. And we do not endorse any vendors or any products, but uh, Bob, had to mention a lot of them because that's the nature of the topic. And the screen prints that we have used um, are used for only for illustration only. And if you go to some similar site, the uh, websites will look similar but not identical. And now we have to give credit where credit is due. And uh, we want to thank Bob Weiss for sharing his expertise, which is very vast and deep. We also thank CIT Computer Integrated Technologies for allowing us to present one of the tools they provide to small businesses. Third, we thank Veritas Marketing, who um, look at each of our webinars to make sure we are consistent and following the same guidelines. And finally, of course, it takes money, and we thank Wells Fargo for funding our webinar program. Thank you, and goodbye.